So I'm interested to compare lists and see how many of them I, I got successfully because I did a little word search too for all the words where me'od comes in because that's the word for like uh, meeting time or appointed time. Okay. It's usually translated that way. Sure. And it was interesting in looking through all of it how um, the, same, the same root word is used for the feasts and festivals but then also the tent of meeting. The word meeting is the same root word. Okay. So it's just interesting that it's sort of like coming to the appointed feasts and festivals is was the same as like coming to God's dwelling place or yeah. appro approaching it and meeting with God there. Yeah. I thought that that was interesting. Yeah, part of that is too, there's three times, three of them involve the men having to come up before the Lord to present themselves before the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would think... Uh, it just feels like it makes it unnecessarily complicated because well, why not every one of them? Why, why only just these main three? But I guess it has to do with the nature of the feast itself. And um, yeah. I know there's reasons behind all of it. I'm just not <clears throat> as familiar with it as I'd like to be. Sure. So, and I've done, I've done Feast of Booths once and I've done Passover. I went to a Seder Passover once and that's about my... That's okay. about the extent of my experience with any of it. Sure. Yeah, I haven't been to like a formal Passover Seder. We've only just, we've tried to have s certain elements involved in our family meal, specifically the unleavened bread and the wine or grape juice for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then like my wife would make lamb meatballs, which... And she would make like a hollandaise sauce that was super delicious on it, just for like the bitter herbs part. Because mm. <laughs> we were like, well, there's not a lot about what you're supposed to do, like they do horse wise. and Yeah. Yeah. Unless you like look up what the tradition is, it's like in scripture, there's like, there's very few actual requirements as part of the feast. It's just supposed to be a feast involving cert certain elements. It's like that for booths too. It's it's very broad. It's like you shall dwell in booths. Yeah. And okay, well, so does that mean it says for seven days? Does that mean you have to sleep out out in the booth, or do you just? I mean, it doesn't define like a limit of time. And I think part of that is just recognizing that there's going to be people in all sorts of different situations and it doesn't want to necessarily be a burden it's about remembering it's about remembering certain things yeah and so it's it leaves it very broad and it's like god leaves it up to us to to put our own spin on it to yeah. uh you know in terms of the details as long as you do the things that I said to do and don't do the things I said not to do <laughs> you're 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 okay you're doing great um, so it looks like the first place that comes up that I was able to find is Exodus thirteen ten, where it talks about Passover. That was the actual Passover during all the plagues. So yeah, that would be the actual observance of the Passover, I think would be in Exodus 13, but the proclamation or the, uh, the ordinance comes in Exodus 12. Okay. Uh, and then he doesn't actually detail it for them to do it again every year until Exodus 23. That's what um, I found. I, don't know if I believe in Exodus 12, he tells them that it's supposed to be a perpetual ordinance. Um, okay. Let me see real quick. Exodus 12. Yeah, so in verse 14 of it, uh, 12, he says, This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And this, uh, and Passover winds up also being nearly synonymous with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as it's supposed to be the kickoff to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. And Unleavened Bread is a week long. Unleavened, the, right? Yeah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day feast. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, with uh, Sabbaths or Holy Convocations being on the bookends. Mm -hmm. What is a, a convocation? As far as I can tell, it basically just means like you're going to, you're, you read scripture. Uh, like as like only. what they're supposed to do or what is it? Like what is the, what is the meaning of the word that's translated as like convocation? Because um, it always, it always seems that it has to do something with the Sabbath at some level. 
Yeah, so anytime you ever, I, I, I can only answer to what the English says. I haven't looked up the Hebrew backing behind a lot of the words, but every time it's the holy convocation is mentioned, or if a feast is said to be a holy convocation or part of the day is, it, it just means that they're supposed to have a Sabbath day of rest. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean reading or... There, there would be involved. They probably would have performed certain readings, and we can actually see that in, um, with Hezekiah and Josiah and Solomon and Ezra and Nehemiah on certain of the festival days when they were honoring or observing the day, they would be reading the law before the people, or they would be conducting certain sacrifices. Yeah, I found that in Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. It talks about at the end of every seventh year, so it's like the conclusion of the Sabbath year, you're supposed to read the law during the Feast of Booths. Yeah. And I don't know if it, I can look and see if it Deuteronomy calls that a Deuteronomy 31. Yeah. Well, the Feast of Booths is also a two, it has two holy convocations or two Sabbaths of rest on the bookends, but it's not like uh, unleavened bread. It's the first day and the eighth day that are the, because the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles has the extra day at the end. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, we, well, uh, we may get into it a little bit, but like when the Feast of Booths start do all of the feasts like start and end on a Sabbath except for booths or do some of them like maybe even start in the middle of a week and you do a you do essentially a Sabbath on a Wednesday or whatever it none of them particularly ever fall on a seventh day of the week unless the unless the calendar the way the moon cycles work winds up being on a Sabbath and I think if it ever falls if the actual like festival falls on an actual sabbath then it's called like a high sabbath or something or like it, i don't know if it has like a special mm. thing i haven't particularly read that in scripture yeah um but <clears throat> so the months were supposed to be based off of the lunar cycle and one of the things i also have references for is for the months or the new moons that they were supposed to observe and the sacrifices that they were supposed to do and because usually when the solemn feasts or um, any of the feasts are mentioned uh, throughout the rest of scripture they always come alongside new moons and sabbaths and solemn feasts mm -hmm. um, so the new moons are supposed to be the demarcation of their months and 12 of them would give you a year except in every 13 years you would get an extra month they would just call it a dar two i think mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the, the sixth day or sorry, the seventh day cycle was always set, but just like our calendar, the days move throughout the, the right. years, right? Right. So you might have Passover on Wednesday one year, but Passover's on Tuesday or Thursday the next year, mm -hmm. whichever way that goes. What's the, um... I didn't think to look this up. What and and I look was looking this up before when I was doing um, feast of booths. Like when is the year supposed to start? And it seemed like some of it had to do with like the actual day after the Sabbath that was after the barley harvest or wheat harvest or something like that. <clears throat> so there was some flexibility, and I was reading about all the different disagreements online about should. Is it strictly a solar calendar or should it be a lunar calendar? And they kind of split the difference in the Jewish calendar. It's kind of both. Um, what the demarcation is for the beginning of like which of the new moons marks the new year, um, I think is. Well, so I guess the basis for that question is like if we didn't know what the Jews had been doing, because like they still have a system that's still in use today. Sure. From back in. Uh, from like immediately after the Exodus, when God said this shall be, you know, the first month, yeah, they the first literally month. have been keeping track and have not last tra lost track since then, in my understanding. Um, if we didn't have that history, like how would we figure out, like what system would we come up with today if we didn't know how they used to do it, just strictly based on scripture? 
Uh, that's an interesting question. It would probably have to be based off of the barley harvest and the new moon before it was, I think, before it was ripe. So the new moon just before it was ripe because first fruits is supposed to be... So in the first month, which they were supposed to observe as the first month of the biblical calendar, um, there are three holidays. Or th there's two, there's t three feasts, but two of them are basically combined. And then there wind up being two Sabbaths or two extra Sabbaths. So what you get is you have Passover on the 14th day at even, which is like the sun going down and you're having dinner and it's turning into the 15th day, which starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. So at Passover, they would still, they would be observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread at the same time or, or the, the, the Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They would <clears> just like bleed one right into the next. Yeah, basically. Um, and then uh, this one's interesting because first fruits is, uh, has the marker of the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest is what is supposed to mark the day that you're supposed to observe first fruits, which is hard because he says you're supposed to do it on the morrow after the Sabbath. And figuring out which Sabbath he's talking about is kind of difficult. Um, That's why I was mentioning earlier, it's, it feels like one of those deduction puzzles. <laughs> so that's it's like, okay, you're given these details, but this one's unclear, but the way you deduce it is by solving something else, which gives you the answer that you then plug in. Yeah, and so basically you have Passover, which is the start of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then sometime after Passover, whether it's the Sabbath of the first day of Unleavened Bread or if it's the weekly Sabbath, um, you have the, free, the Feast of first fruits, um, and that one's not supposed to be a holy convocation, I don't believe. I don't think it's a, a Sabbath. Um, but then you have the seventh day of unleavened bread. But the interesting thing is, is we need to know which, um, which Sabbath he's talking about for first fruits or what the schedule is for first fruits, because that day is supposed to be the counter starter for Pentecost, which is 50 days after uh, first fruits. So, <clears throat> I, I ran into this last night as I was putting this together. And um, so this is what I wind up, wound up coming up with. And this is what I, and I, I believe as the Christ is the fulfillment of um, these festivals that uh, he's kind of, he, he would be the key to mm -hmm. maybe unlocking this, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the date of the observance of this one is interesting because there's actually not a specific date given to it like there is with Passover or any of the other um, festivals aside from Pentecost. Yet it was meant to be the marker to be used to count towards Pentecost. So looking at the New Testament references might give better indication on what the Lord intended as Christ has become the first fruits of them that slept says uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. So we might look at the time of, of his resurrection until Pentecost actually happened. So in Luke 22, verses 1, and then 7 through 15, we have uh, Christ observing Passover, which is also called the first day of unleavened bread in Luke. And then in Luke 24, we have the resurrection on the first day of the week. Um, and that's where I believe first fruits would have happened, would have been Christ's resurrection. He's the first fruits of them that's left. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when the day that he rises would be the, f the feast of first fruits. Right. Um, and that happened on the first day of the week, which happened on the Sabbath after the Sabbath of unleavened bread. So the, it's the weekly Sabbath after Passover or after the first day of unleavened bread. Um, and then in Acts 1, Luke uh, is writing to Theophilus, um, and he says he, Jesus was seen of them 40 days after his resurrection. Um, so from, from the resurrection plus 40 days, and then he ascends, right? Mm -hmm. And then Pentecost is supposed to be... The 50th day. The 50th day. So within the next week, probably, is or the next seven days would be Pentecost uh, because he rose on the third day. So, you know... 
doing the math there. And then in Acts 2, 1, it's, uh, we find Peter and all the disciples at Pentecost. Now, there's one other passage in the Old Testament that also helps, I think, unlock this, which is Joshua in chapter 5. It says that they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. So they observed the Passover, which would also be the Sabbath, mm -hmm. uh, the first day of unleavened bread. So on the morrow after the Sabbath, they were eating old corn. But the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten that corn. So two days after. So two days after that, and neither had they manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Which to me, this possibly indicates that first fruits, which is what I said before, is supposed to be based on the Sabbath after the Sabbath of Passover or the Sabbath of unleavened bread. So basically, you get a Sabbath of rest on the first day of unleavened bread, and then sometime in the week, uh, regardless of if Passover is on Monday or Passover is on Friday, the, the weekly Sabbath would then be the next thing. And so first fruits would basically wind up always being the first day of the week following unleavened bread, if that makes sense. And then from there you start counting. But that's the first fruits was supposed to be the commandment for the first fruits um, is Exodus 34 was the first reference to it that I came across? Yes, me too. So 34 and 22, um, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Um, feast of weeks would be Pentecost, uh, first fruits of the wheat harvest. I think in that one it's actually referring to unleavened bread because um, his, his next statement is thrice in the year shall all your mid-child appear before the Lord. And the three that he mentions are unleavened bread, feast of weeks, and feast of ingathering. So I think maybe the next one would actually be Leviticus 23 is where he gives the more detailed. Mm -hmm. That's the overview of all of them in one place. Yeah. So in Leviticus 23 verses 10 through 12. He says, the commandment is when ye come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And ye shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And so because this was supposed to be based off of... Um, uh, this, for one, in the or the, chrono the chronology of what he's listing out as the Feast of the Lord, he lists the Sabbath as the weekly Sabbath, and then he lists the Passover, followed by unleavened bread, followed by first fruits. So first fruits should be a Sabbath within the first month. Um, but first fruits was supposed to be designated by the um, the beginning of the reaping of the harvest, right? And the barley harvest was the first one to pop up from their winter crops. Right, because you have two harvests every year, and it's this is it makes it, I guess, especially I don't know if I'd use the word complicated, but especially like, feel like feeling like I have to start from scratch because I know so little about agriculture. We're so far removed, it's like, wait a minute, there's two? There's two harvests every year? Oh yeah, you have spring harvest, and then you have yeah. fall harvest. Um, and there's there's all sorts of laws relating to like assuming that you know that. Yeah. And then the same thing with different laws for annual crops versus like orchards and things. There's yeah. there's even different sets of laws for gathering and harvesting and planting. Yeah, because basically what was going to happen is um, in the seventh month, he as part of the three times in the year that they're supposed to come up before him, he says Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. He says Feast of... Uh, First fruits, which would be the week of unleavened bread and the first fruits feast. Um, and then the feast of ingathering was the third other one that they were supposed to do. And the feast of ingathering is synonymous with the feast of tabernacles or the feast of booths, right? Um, so and it was, have, all, it was, and that was basically the Thanksgiving. That was Thanksgiving for the, mm -hmm. for the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, thanking him for, Allowing us to come through the year, giving us all of our provision, and providing for us through what would be the next few months of winter. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it seems like 
Tabernacles and booths, it's, you know, if you just take the year starting in winter and then ending at the beginning of the next winter, um, you've got the story basically from Exodus to entering the land, just all, all right there from Passover, right? Which was the first one in the first month Mm -hmm. all the way through to the fall harvest, which is now you're in the new land and the manna has ceased. And now you're actually fully in because you're harvesting Mm -hmm. from the, from the land that year. Yeah. So it's kind of like that's the full cycle. You went from harvesting in Egypt and eating there to being brought out. And now you're harvesting in the new place. Yeah. And so what did you say? Um, so yeah, I had down here in gathering tabernacles and booths is all different names for the same feast. Yeah. And then what was it? Um, weeks and so first feast fruits. Of weeks, I believe refers to Pentecost or Shavuot, Shavuot is how you say it. Um, but yeah, so feast of weeks would be Pentecost and that one's the 50 days after the feast of first fruits. Um, and then the other one is, uh, feast of, so weeks, first fruits and in gathering. So yeah, in gathering is tabernacles. First fruits is unleavened bread or first fruits. Um, and then feast of weeks would be Pentecost, which is why all the disciples were together in Jerusalem during Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why he said, Terry here. <laughs> So you'll have Passover, which then bleeds over into unleavened bread slash first fruits. Mm-hmm. And then the next big of, of the three feasts is, well, so it's interesting. It doesn't say that you're supposed to all be gathered for Passover, it says for unleavened bread. But since they yeah. bleed over, you basically are supposed to yeah, be there Yeah, because they Passover. would have to be there for the first day of unleavened bread, which Luke also points out is they they were celebrating the feast they were celebrating passover and then luke says which was the first day of unleavened bread <laughs> okay yeah so passover it's technically different and referred to as a different feast but it's all the it's same. a special it's a separate special event but it, it it also falls in line with the symbology of the feast of unleavened bread or what was supposed to be the fulfillment so and then the next big one was the feast of weeks which is where everybody was supposed to gather. Yes. And which is also Pentecost or Shavuot. Yeah. And then the last big one was in gathering slash tabernacle slash booths. Yeah. And so then so that's, that's, four. that's four of them. So the you've got three. Passover, Passover and unleavened bread count as two. And then first fruits is three. And then I thought you said unleavened bread is first fruits. They count as different feasts. So okay. there, so I believe that there's supposed to be seven altogether um, that were ordained by the Lord because he separates, he gives a distinction between Passover and unleavened bread, but they fall on the same, they, they begin on the same day. Mm-hmm. Um, so pa- And Passover technically ends, but you're still within unleavened bread. Yeah. And then it is the last day of unleavened bread, the first fruits? No. So first fruits will actually fall in the middle of the week of unleavened bread. Okay. Or it should. Kind of hard. I think how to note. I, I think typically or traditionally for first fruits, they will celebrate it on the sixteenth of um, Nisan, which I think is the first month. Yeah. Um, That's. I think it's a, a either a bib or Nisan. I think because there's the there's the difference between if they're using the Babylonian name or the. Hebraic name. Okay, so you've got Passover, the, which is also the first day of unleavened bread. Yeah, so that's and two. Then you've got first fruits, also happens within that within the week of unleavened bread. That's yeah, an exciting week. And then <laughs> you have then the feast of unleavened bread ends, and then and so, then the feast of unleavened bread ends. So is that a full? That's seven days altogether. That's a seven day of, okay. uh, event. And it'd be interesting because, like, what happens if? And that's why I'm like, I'm pretty sure the Feast of First Fruits is supposed to be the first, um, the first first day of the week after Passover. Right, because like this it, is the only one where it is 
Well, not, not the only one, but I, it actually says what day of the month it's supposed to be on, which yeah. could be any day of the week. Which could be any day of the week, yes, according to our calendar, right? Like, or even, it, it could or fall even anywhere. Their calendar, yeah, right? yeah, even in their calendar. It could just, because of our cycles, it could fall anywhere. It's not like an even cycle, right? Mm-hmm. Or a perfect cycle. Right. The, the, the week doesn't fit into any, like, it has nothing to do with. Yeah, you're just looking at solar. This, or, is, this is why the days are based off of the lunar cycle, is because you wait for the new moon. That's the demarcation for your, the first of your month. And then the the, uh, the full moon will mark your 15th day of the month, right? So when you see the full moon, you know it's the 15th day of the month. You know the full moon's coming. Mm-hmm. It's the 15th day of the month. You're halfway through. Right. Which is why Where, the feasts usually start either on the first... Actually, there's only one feast that starts on the first day of the week, which we'll get to in a second. But uh, the rest of them will fall in the middle. So... Where Where is that? I don't think I was able to find where it says that the months are supposed to start with the new moon. Do you know where that is? Uh, I have references to the new moon. Oh, excuse me. A little stuffed up. So, in Numbers 10... Numbers 10.10... 10. Yeah, so Numbers 10.10, 10, also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, in the beginning of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. And then in Numbers 28, he gives um, so that one doesn't some mention sacri- the moon. <laughs> it doesn't mention the m- the moon, but it says in the beginning of your month. Right. right? So that we're looking for something else for what's supposed to be the demarcation of the beginning of a month. Yeah. So Numbers 28 is... Uh, so Numbers 28, starting in verse 9, gives you the Sabbath rules. It says, On the Sabbath day, two lambs of the first year without spot, two tenth deals of flour for meat offering mingled with oil. And the drink offering thereof, Uh, this is the burnt offering of every Sabbath beside the continual burnt offering and his his drink offering. And then it moves into the monthly offerings. Um, And this is also in the beginning of your months. Um, And then he gives the sacrifices for your beginning of months. So it's like, okay, what marks marks my month? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So you have those. And those are beginning of months. And then first... Samuel 25 through 24. David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go that I may hide myself in the field. And then he talks to Jonathan about not being at the new moon feast, right? What chapter was that? Um, That's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, starting in verse 5. And then First Chronicles 23, I think, outlines some things that, uh, uh, not Samuel, Sam, not Samson, Solomon, um, he did, um, so First Chronicles 23, 31, 23, 31, uh, and it's talking about the stuff that he set up, and he says, And to offer all burnt sacrifices unto the Lord, and the Sabbaths, and the new moons, and on the set feasts by number according to order, commanded unto them continually before the Lord. Um, and then there's just a bunch of other references to the new moon, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, so and I know that the Jews took it into account for when the, the <clears throat> definitions of months were. I'm wondering where they got that from, because everything that I saw... And I'd have to go back and look where I found this. Yeah. They, it was based on an interpretation. It wasn't, I don't think it was explicit. They admitted, like, we're interpreting this to mean that the moon has something to do with it. Yeah, so recall what he said to do in Numbers 10. Well, because I think it was basically the definition of the month when God gave him a new calendar coming out of Egypt. God said, this is the first day of the new year, of, of the new month of the new year. Yeah. So God did give this them... This is the first of your months. Yeah, God did give them a specific today. <clears throat> reset your calendars today. Yep. And um, 
then from then on, I think they took it into account. They took the moon cycle into account. I don't know if it was ever commanded that they do that, though. Yeah, and this is interesting. So remember what he says in uh, Numbers 10.10. 10. He says, Also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginning of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings. Now, if we flip over to Psalm 81, I believe this is, this isn't, it explains, it may, I think here makes the connection of why they were observing the new moons as the beginning of their months. It's not like, oh, now we get to Psalms and we finally have a reason for it. Mm -hmm. It's, this is what they've this been what doing they've been and doing. this is the connection. So in Psalm 81, um, yeah, verse three. Yeah, verse 3. He says, Blow up the trumpet in the new moon and in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. Right? And so... So the, and solemn... the trumpet is specifically referring to the Feast of Tabernacles? No. Could the, it be the, just the trumpet, them? they actually, in uh, verse, in Numbers 10, there's supposed to be various trumpet calls. Right? Um, it, he gives them... He tells them, make two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And then he gives them a list of reasons why they should be blowing the trumpet. Mm -hmm. One of them in verse 10 being, uh, blow the trumpet. At um, the beginning of your months. In the beginning of your months, right? And David, um, well, it's or a, sorry, At Asaph. your appointed feast and at the beginning of your months. Yeah, at so the, it seems that those are related. Yeah, yeah, and so there, the new moon was a feast. If we go back to what David was talking to Jonathan about, about right, he's like, "I'm not going to be able to sit at the new moon feast with the king, right? Because he wants mm. to kill me." Um, but Asaph here uh, gives the connection. I believe he says, "Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day." So. I don't think the new moons were supposed to be a holy convocation, but they were supposed to be a feast day of, hey, let's get together, have a potluck, mm -hmm. right? And celebrate the, the new moon. Or not, we're not celebrating the new moon, but we're just observing the fact that the Lord has brought us through, you know. And also because um, in Genesis 1, on the fourth day, when he said... Um, uh, when he set the stars and the sun and the moon in the sky, right? Um, well, the, yeah, this is one of the first appearances of the word ma'od, which is an appointed time. And it says, God created them for signs and seasons and days and years. Mm -hmm. And the word, I think, season in English is their translation of the word ma'od, which is basically just means meeting or appointed time. Yeah. And so uh, there on the fourth day... Um, he's marking out, he's, he's giving, uh, not solar, he's giving cosmological indicators of when mm -hmm. certain seasons or events are happening. And like I said, Psalm 81 makes a really good connection. Um, he does, uh, there is a, I have a highlighted here for Isaiah 66. Oh, I think this is God telling them that when I come back, you're going to be observing the new ones. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Yeah, so at the very end of Isaiah, in Isaiah 66, um, he says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one noon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship me or come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Which is really interesting statement for the Lord to be making after the new heavens and the new earth are created. So regardless of if the new heavens and the new earth are created or are here already, he still says we're supposed to be coming before him on the new moons and Sabbath days. Jeremiah is one of the more interesting books because of how many references it makes to that with the new covenant, the feasts and festivals <coughs> of the new covenant. Because but we're not here Jeremiah, to talk about Sabbath. <laughs> what is it? Jeremiah 33? Uh, uh, is I think is one of the like the prod basically one of the earliest most detailed depictions of the new covenant. Yeah, there's there's a bunch. Yeah, between Isaiah and Jeremiah and even like Ezekiel and others, like there's there's so much talking about the the future fulfillment in our in our hope to come. Um, but yeah, so according to God, 
now and when the new heavens and new earth get here, whether they're here or not, and whatever, um, he says we will be coming before him during the new moon and the Sabbaths and the solemn feast days. Because at the end of um, Zechariah, in Zechariah 14, he even says then, like, after I've destroyed everybody, all the heathen in Armageddon that came up against Jerusalem, they better come up to, while I'm reigning here, yeah, yeah, exactly, (laughs) they they better come up during the Feast of Tabernacles to honor me. Or else I won't give them any rain. Exactly. There's one other, uh, (laughs) while we're talking about Feast of Tabernacles, an interesting thing about the Feast of Tabernacles is... Jeroboam <clears throat> made a, a mock of the Feast of Tabernacles. So in First Kings, when it's talking about what uh, Jeroboam was doing, um, it says that in order to make sure that the Israelites didn't go back to Jerusalem and stop following him as king, so to turn their hearts and minds away from Jerusalem, he ordained a feast like unto the feast that is in Judah in the seventh month. Mm -hmm. They basically made a counterfeit everything. They made a counterfeit temple. They made all their own counterfeit festivals because they're like, well, we like these a lot. But also, the temple is over there and we don't have it. (laughs) And, And of course... Our current day church would never do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, there's so many interesting things there. So the only other two that we haven't talked about so, yeah, really. Wait, what? A counterfeit church with counterfeit believers? No, yeah. no, never. <laughs> um, so we talked about Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and pass or Pentecost and Tabernacles. There's two really big ones that we haven't talked about, um, and these two have very little mention throughout scripture the day of atonement or sorry the feast of trumpets which is the the interesting part about this feast is it is the only one that is ever on the first day of a month which is interesting because it falls in line with a new moon the thing that marks the feast of trumpets is a new moon Hmm. and the thing that makes it hard to celebrate the feast of trumpets is you don't know the day of the Feast of Trumpets, because the new moon is hard to see. <laughs> yeah. You can't, and what they usually have to do is they usually have to celebrate the new moon twice. Or what they do is Rosh Kodesh is celebrated twice because you you, the, you, you don't see the sliver, and then you see the sliver, and you're like, okay, yesterday was the, the actual new moon. Right. Right? Because the, when you see the sliver, you know that you're a day late. A yeah, day after. and so it's really hard to know the day or the hour of the <laughs> Feast of Trumpets. Anyways, and I've got a bunch of uh, possible references to Feast of Trumpets. But in Leviticus 23... So so in that sense, they celebrated it early just in case they missed it? They celebrated it early and on time or late, whichever one it was, right? (laughs) Um, So the Feast of Trumpets barely has any references to it as far as law and what to do on it. Hmm. All it says to do is we have Leviticus 23 verse 24 giving us like when... They were supposed to do it and why and also how they were supposed to do it they were supposed to blow a trumpet and gather the or have a assembly and then the next day that we have is the day of atonement which has interesting language on when it's supposed to happen and i believe this can also be used as a connection to how passover timeline is supposed to be read because sometimes there's debate on whether or not Passover is its own day apart from the first day of unleavened bread. So some people believe that you have Passover's unleavened or Passover happens on the 14th day at even, the the start, the even of the start of the 14th day, if that makes sense, because when uh, in biblical calendar accounting, it's night to day or night to night, right? Right. And so the 14th day at even could refer to the, the beginning of the 14th day. Right, and so you have Passover all the way up until the fifteenth day at even, which starts on leavened bread. So that's one interpretation of Passover. But <clears throat> I say all that to say this because the Day of Atonement, the the language used um, in I believe it's Leviticus, says that it happens on the ninth day at even, on the tenth day of the seventh month. Right, and. This is the only holiday, or, and sorry, I won't say that. It's, it's a holiday that only has one day, 
It's not a seven-day feast like uh, Passover or the Feast of Weeks, or I mean Tabernacles, I mean. Um, so this one-day celebration has the same language of start it on the ninth day at even, it's on the tenth day of the month, right? So I believe there's a connection there between the language used to designate the time for that and the time used to designate Passover. Even though Luke makes it explicitly clear that they celebrated Passover and it was the first day of unleavened bread. <laughs> so the one the, uh, unleavened bread, sorry, the one you were talking about, that's only a one day thing. That's the Day of Atonement? That's the Day of Atonement. Right. Yeah, Feast of Trumpets and Day of Atonement and Pentecost and the Feast of First Fruits and Passover technically are all one one day, right? Right, but there's like between Passover and Pentecost, like, yeah, the first day of Passover is also the first week, a, a week-long part of unleavened bread and when first fruits within that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a 50 days that you count to get to the end of that period, and then Pentecost is on the 50th day. Yeah, technically unleavened bread stops on the seventh day after, so it'll stop on the 21st of the first month. But you're still counting seven sevens right. from that time frame. Right. Pen up the day to of Pentecost. Pentecost is defined by the by Passover. By Pat first fruits, technically, but yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, but yeah, so the last two that make up the seven feasts of the Lord are trumpets and day of atonement. So, and then trumpets is on, uh, when is that supposed to be? On the first of which month? That one in Leviticus says it's supposed to be the first day of the seventh month. Excuse me. So, Leviticus. so basically exactly halfway through the year. Yeah. And there's some interesting things that have uh, happened on the first day of the seventh month. And like... Uh, uh, observances, possible observances. One is in Ezra 3, 6 when they were, um, I don't even think the foundation of the temple had been laid yet, but uh, they were being sent back by, what, Artaxerxes. Cyrus? Or Artaxerxes in, by chapter 3? Let me uh, see. I think it would have been Cyrus. Because um, Artaxerxes yeah. is <clears throat> later when yeah. they have to like reinvestigate. Wait, did, were you allowed to rebuild this? Yeah. So, uh, so Ezra chapter 3, verse, where was it? Verse 6. Um, I'll start in verse 4 because it says, They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. And then... From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So, um, I believe that they were probably observing the Feast of Trumpets at that time because it just got done saying that they're doing all of the stuff that they were supposed to. Uh, Nehemiah also talks about it in Nehemiah chapter 8. And I won't read this whole thing because there's like 12 verses, but um, they spake, uh, and this is what they were, and this is one of the things that uh, they were doing on the first day of the month as part of like the Holy Convocation. This is why I said scripture gets read probably at the Holy Convocations. It says, uh, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Um, Ezra brought the law before the congregation, um, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein. And then as he finished reading it, they were all weeping and they told him, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. It's like, be glad. This is supposed to be a happy day. Right. But he was also kind of glad that they're sad because he's like, you, yeah, should, you, should, you, be you should be weeping before the be Lord sad. and But repentance. don't just cry forever. Actually do what it says. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then I have my own speculations on, I have already sort of alluded to the no man knows the day or the hour. So this is the first, the, the first day of the seventh month, which would fall on a new moon. 
Uh, so Matthew 24, 19 through 36 talks about um, after these things happen, uh, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the, um, the stars won't give their light and you'll see the and then the Lord will descend with his angels and you'll send them out at the blast of the trumpet to go gather all of the elect from the four winds, right? Uh, Luke 21, same, same thing. First Thessalonians chapter four talks about uh, the Lord coming at the last trump um, to gather the saints. Uh, similar stuff from Matthew 24 and Luke 21. In Revelation 11 is, um, I believe that's actually the seventh trump. Yeah, you really can't understand Revelation because there's so many allusions to feasts and festivals and just stuff in the Old Testament throughout, the language that it uses, apocalyptic style language. Where you're like, what in the world is this talking about? Well, if you were Jewish, which and I would argue that Revelation was written before the destruction of the temple, the Jews would have been able to understand, I think, a lot more at that time because they were still actively practicing all, you know, everything that John is alluding to in its visions. Yeah, and I believe the uh, religious proselyte converts were also celebrating them. But mm -hmm. the, here, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a really um, interesting thing. Um, back in Numbers 10, um, I read this before and I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, this is, again, talking about the various trumpet calls that they have to make. He says, When they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When ye blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. Um, and then he says, But when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. So um, is that the reference to the last trumpet? Because there might only be one. Well, which, so in which case, that one, the first one, was also the last. Uh, possibly. Um, he or says the last meaning second. Well, he says in verse nine too. He says, "If ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies." Now, remember in Revelation. What I'm not sure like what you might believe in Revelation, what's going on. But I believe by this, that by the end of the seventh trumpet, the enemy, uh, the other thing that will be happening at this time is the fifth, uh, the, the sixth vial and the seventh vial will, the sixth vial will have been poured out at this same time. And then the seventh vial and the seventh trumpet are happening at the same time. Because the fifth trumpet says that, um, or sorry, the sixth vial says, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Um, and then three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gather them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now this is actually alluded to back in, um, it might be Isaiah or Jeremiah. I got the, my my prophecy or my prophets mixed up but he he says this same thing where he's going to dry up the euphrates and he's going to allow all of the nations to come up against jerusalem to gather them together in megiddo right um our Arm, megiddon yeah our megiddon um but then the seventh trumpet in chapter 11 um is the last trumpet and that's when um it says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name shall, or sorry, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. 
And basing off of whatever the seventh vial, the seventh vial also says, this is the time when the Lord is descending, I believe, in conjunction with Thessalonians and Matthew and Luke. Mm -hmm. And so the Feast of Trumpets, while barely mentioned about what they're supposed to do, all it is is blow the trumpet, have a holy feast. It's supposed to be a glad feast, right? Because you're being delivered from your enemies, mm. <laughs> um, is what I believe. But um, it's really fun. And I'm not saying I know the day or the hour. I'm just saying it would be very interesting if the Lord returned on the Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> and So let me look through here. And 24 is obviously referring to the destruction of the temple, which happened. Uh, 24... Revelation? No, no, no. no Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Uh, let me go back real quick. Matthew 24. And I can't r remind me of your... Uh, do you have like a defined eschatology e are you, that you're set in or are you still... Yeah, okay. I have a fairly set... Um, so are you... Uh, so no, I... It, there, or... I, a I asked Doug about this because he... He asked me where I stood as far as like if I was his uh, what would you, what historic was versus his, dispensational. Yeah, historic versus dispensational, and I didn't know because I don't. I believe some differentish things than I think that they do. And he said, and he told me I was like dispensationalist, but with some heavy modifications. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Let's the thing see. that I like about dispensationalists, I used to be one. The thing that I like about them the most is that they put a lot more weight and stuff onto the feasts and festivals, which I think is a good thing. Uh, well, he says he, even when he was celebrating Passover that he said Passover wasn't even fully fulfilled. According to Luke, when, when Luke writes the account, Jesus says that not even Passover is fully fulfilled, which is interesting. What's that reference? Uh, oh, yeah. That uh, so that's Luke 22. I believe it's probably like, I don't know, verse 14 or something. I don't know. Let me look. I know, it, know where it is. Oh, meaning he, will, he won't drink the cup of Passover again until I drink it. Yeah, I will, know, I will not anymore eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. But right before that, he says, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Right. And then he says, I'm not going to eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God, which even indicates that Jesus is still going to eat Passover. So right. we should well, imitate or Christ, right? The only, <laughs> other, the only other way you could argue it is that if the kingdom of God came with Christ's resurrection, the first fruits now and Jesus made a couple of different allusions to the kingdom he said the kingdom is upon you a couple of different times sure um, where the 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 Jewish leaders told him you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub mm -hmm. and Jesus said you can't uh, you can't cast out you can't plunder a strong man's house unless you first bind the strong man and he said if I cast out demons by the power of God, then the Satan, then the strong man is bound and the kingdom of God is upon you. I'm combining a couple of different things from, from different gospels, but um, in one of them he says, if I cast out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God is, by the power of God, then the kingdom of God is upon you. Which I take it yeah. to mean that the kingdom was already there, but then also then... But, but then, what does he tell then, Pilate? But then how could Jesus say that I won't drink it until I'm with you in the kingdom, if exactly. the kingdom was already there? And what else does he tell Pilate? He tells him, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would not suffer this to even happen. Mm -hmm. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's not here yet. Well, he said <laughs> it's not of this world, which I don't think the kingdom will ever be of this world. It's of uh, God. I believe he is bringing his kingdom here. When yes, he comes and touches down during his millennial reign, he will be bringing... But it didn't originate from here. Yes, correct. It's, yes. it's not it, of the flesh and blood. Right. It's not, of, it's not of here, but it will be here. Yeah. It's like, if I have, as as I've, I've have, you, <laughs> I have you over to my house right now, yeah. you're not of this house, but you are in this house. Yeah. I mean, uh, all the earth are, is the Lord in the fullness. You're not of this house, but you're here right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, there's just, there's interesting things about, uh, and this is one of the things I was talking with Doug about too, is um, as 
as Christians and followers of Christ, um, we're in this weird already but not yet state, Mm -hmm. right? Paul talks about um, pressing forward as if to win the race, right? But what did he say? I was like, I've already attained it. Right, Christ like, it's already, already won it. It's already been attained. I just have to do, I have to get through the chapters of the book to get to the end. Mm-hmm. Right? It's already it's written. Like, it's already written. He's the author and finisher of my faith. It's already done. Right. But I'm still in the middle of the story, so I have to right. be in the story. Yeah, I like to think of that as well. There's a there's an na- analogy between the priests and the high priests. Like, yes, you had the high priest who offered his yearly sacrifice, the once a year day of atonement sacrifice, which is what Christ did. Mm -hmm. But then also we're the normal, regular, everyday priests and we have to offer sacrifices every day. So it's like, yes, Christ did the ultimate one and now we copy him and we do the daily ones. Mm -hmm. So we still offer sacrifices in that sense. Yeah, we just offer different sacrifices. We're not concerned. Like we even give up. The thing is, is the only sacrifices that Hebrews really talks about us doing away with or not needing, we're, we didn't do away with them. It's just the, the debt to them has already been paid. There's no need for them anymore, mm-hmm. right? It's pointless. The animals. It's the animal sacrifice. The it's Testament, the blood. Right. The New Testament does refer, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Exactly. We offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. We yep. offer sacrifices of, of praise. Of joy. Praise. Psalm says. Um, well, I'm specifically referring to the New Testament. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so yeah, so you have, you, we still offer our bodies, we still offer Thanksgiving, we still offer praise. And we offer tithes and offerings to the, the Lord. Or we offer to Him our first fruits, or right. we should be. Right. right. I don't think it specifically, explicitly references that in the New Testament, but I would, uh, I would agree with that as well. I don't think that the New Testament gives an exhaustive list of, of new sacri- of of sacrifices. In other words, like, well, if you're not giving thanks and then you're not giving praise, then it's not an acceptable sacrifice. Well, no, there can be. I think there can still be sacrifices of um, remembrance. Sure. Offered. Um, what that would look like. That's that's another thing I have on my list to study. Like, what is the significance of um, sacrifices? There's some very obvious ones. Like we were just reading the other day. <clears throat> At the very beginning of Leviticus, it talks about um, grain offerings, and when you make cakes, it's like you, you, they need to be smeared with oil and they need to be crushed grain, and so it's like you've got all of these references to Christ, because smearing something with oil that was anointing something. Oh, and those ones were supposed to be unleavened. Yes, <laughs> you've got so you've got unleavened, so you've got without sin. Christ was without sin; he was anointed by God. You know, during John's baptism, the the Holy Spirit came and anointed mm-hmm. him. Um, and then, then it's broken, and yeah. then it's burned. <laughs> so it's like there's your picture of Christ right there. Um, and and actually, there's some interesting things about um, the observance of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that Christ fulfilled. And it's and this is why you know I don't believe that we should be taking communion so often. It's supposed to be saved for a special event. And the other idea behind com- be- taking communion like once a week or once a month or once a quarter is nobody can really agree on when, how often you're supposed to do it because Scripture doesn't seem to right. tell you how often the Lord instituted it. He just says as often, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you take it into the context of when he was talking and when he says as often as you do this, was during Passover. It was, he was taking Passover, which is beyond shadow of a doubt what he was doing. And the observance of Passover included the unleavened bread. And so when you take, the Lord did not institute the Lord's Supper. The Lord gave fulfillment to the elements of the Passover meal, which was importantly the unleavened bread and the, the cup of uh, the cup of the blood of remission of sins, right? Mm. The wine. The third cup. Of the cup and so of when you take that out of the context of that, you, okay, you lose the context of unleavened bread. You no longer need to have unleavened bread whenever you're doing it because it's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. But right, it, has, right. it has specific meaning because Christ was giving the fulfillment of the fact that it's his sinless body that was broken for us, right? The unleavened body, which... I'm sorry, but the amount of verses that talk about leaven being sin outweigh the one verse 
Well, that Jesus he, compares it to the kingdom. When he compares it to the, ki- the woman with the three meals in the kingdom of God. Whatever that one means, well, the so gospel I, means. And I think I referenced this before um, on Sunday, where there is, in one sense, kind of a flow reversal of like between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old In the old covenant, unrighteousness contaminated things, like sin in that sense, because Christ hadn't come yet. Yeah. The power of sin was stronger than the power of righteousness. Like an un, when an unclean thing and a clean thing touch, which one wins? The unclean thing contaminates the clean thing. So you consecrate yourself for eight days. <laughs> right, right. But so there was still a path to you know, cleansing something. Yeah. But in the immediate short term, the, the unclean thing wins out. Yeah. It spreads. In the new covenant, you have obviously Jesus cleansing lepers and instead of Jesus becoming contaminated and needing to yeah. go cleanse himself, now the, now there is no more leper. It's mm-hmm. a clean person. And so you have kind of that flow reversal. Um, whereas previously things were prohibited from being brought into the Holy of Holies because you, God's goodness would destroy you. In the new covenant, um, the vision of uh, the third temple at the end of Ezekiel, it talks about there's water flowing out from the Holy of Holies underneath the threshold of the temple, and it cleanses everything, it cleanses mm-hmm. the whole world. Um, so you've got, you you've got, you've got a, like a flow reversal there. Like you used to not be able to go in yeah. to the Holy of Holies, but now the veil is torn and God's holiness comes out. Yeah, actually, and I was just... It gives you life instead of killing you. Yeah, I was just reading an interesting thing about that in Hebrews. Um, oh, no, nope, it's Hebrews 6.20. I flipped right past it. Ah, yes. Um, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Right? Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we have our high priest who has gone beyond the veil for us, and our hope is that we're continuing after him. Mm-hmm. Right? And our own consecration, our sanctification through our life until our chapters, our book ends. Right? And then we get to start a new book. <laughs> Number two. <clears throat> Um, so we've gone over, uh, well, at least briefly, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, the feast of weeks slash Pentecost slash Shavuot, um, and then the next one is in gathering slash tabernacle slash booths is all the same thing, yeah. which is the end of the year harvest. Where did um, so? And then trumpets is in the middle of the year. Yeah. So and um, and then um, when is Day of Atonement? So Day of Atonement. So trumpets is the first day of the seventh month. And then, um, sorry, let me go ahead and make a note. In uh, tabernacles is usually in like the ninth month. Tabern- oh no no. Ta- oh, so they're all. <laughs> So all of the end of the fall, the fall festivals are all in the same month. So you have trumpets starting off. This. Well, that's in the summer, right? Seventh month is... Seventh month is our September, Okay. October time range. Uh, it could even be like, I don't know, what is it this year? It's um, Okay, so then Tabernacles is usually within the seventh month as well. Uh, yeah, they're all... Uh, and that one's defined by... Trumpets... Day of Atonement and Tabernacles are all in the seventh month. So is, when is Tabernacles? Is that defined on a certain day of the month? Yeah, that is one that... is the 15th day of the seventh month until the 22nd day of the seventh month because it's an eight-day feast versus the seven-day feast. So this year, Feast of... And then, um, then Atonement, sorry, Atonement is when... The ni- that, that's the, the ninth day at even, but it's the tenth day of the seventh month. It starts the ninth day at even... Okay, um, so you got trumpets and then uh, Day of Atonement and then a few days later, booths. Yep. So trumpets gets marked by the new moon, I believe. Um, tabernacles would be marked by the full moon and then in the middle of them would be Day of Atonement. And so those are... So that, that in that sense, you've got kind of a beginning of time, end of time thing and you've got Day of Atonement in between. So it's like right in the middle of yeah. The there's some very heavy eschatological uh, over undertones mm-hmm. 
in the in the feast and the fulfillment because except for the day of atonement which um might even be partially fulfilled uh like hebrews talks about like the, we have our high priest who has once entered in and mm-hmm. you know now sits down it doesn't have to go in year by year right well um, it, I, I've, I've heard this as well you mentioned sitting down the priest there was not a chair in the holy of holies for him to sit anywhere Oh so he yeah, couldn't, I, he couldn't sit anywhere until he left and finished his sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I didn't even mention this about Pentecost, but maybe maybe we'll have time for that. Um, he did not enter into the holy places made with hand, which are the figures, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Um, he must have suffered since the foundation, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Um, yeah, so it doesn't actually say he sat down, but it says he sat down at the right hand of God, the throne of God. But he entered in, I, may, maybe he waited until that day of atonement for that year that after he died to do it. I don't know, man. <laughs> or it was an already done thing. Who knows? But the interesting thing about the Feast of Pentecost, real quick, um, because this one's cool too, as far as like symbology. Um, The the directions for the priests or, or for the sacrifices of Passover and unleavened bread specifically says, you will not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, according to Leviticus. Um... Uh, I think it's Leviticus 23 and then Deuteronomy maybe. Um, but Pentecost, it says they, the priest will offer two loaves of specifically mentions leavened bread right before the Lord as part of their offerings bef- uh, before him. And so I believe when Christ ascended, he... Uh, There was a week of waiting, and then at the the day of Pentecost, as our high priest now, um, he offered up the two loaves in heaven, which were supposed to represent the Jew and the Gentiles coming together as one, which Paul Mm. says that now the veil of um, separation has been taken away from us, right? And so I believe... Passover was this huge, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits was this huge, like, feast time of just talking about Christ coming and being the sacrifice, the firstborn sacrifice for our sins and also the first fruits of our uh, resurrection and a sinless body, right? Unleavened bread. But then Pentecost is this representation of the middle wall of partition being broken down between. Jew and Gentile or Jew and outsider, Jew and stranger, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And being offered up together as the two loaves of bread during Pentecost. So that one's cool too. That's interesting. Yeah, it brings to mind, I think it might be that same passage where it talks about he, in Christ's flesh, he's broken down the dividing wall Mm -hmm. between uh, Jew and Gentile. Yeah, except they have their own spiritual blinders (laughs) on. He says, basically. So when when was the Feast of Weeks? Did we talk about when that actually is? It, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, is supposed to be 50 days after first fruits. So, so you're that'll supposed always be to, in the second month. Or no, no, no. At the beginning of the third month. Yeah, third month-ish. Well, if it's always exactly 50 days after. Yeah, because, yeah, it'd be in the third third month. So, like, this month we start Passover and... In April and Shavuot is May twenty fifth. So well, right, but I'm just strictly talking in uh, yeah for for like the Jew, Jewish months. Uh, so I'm well, let's that, see. Uh, there's a little bit of wiggle room on exactly. Uh, yeah, it well, could no. and it could be anywhere between the end of the second month and the beginning of the third. Because month. the only thing that's variable is the exact number of days in the first month and the second month. That's going to determine exactly what day of the third month it'll be on. It well, it could well like in this. Uh, you might have a day that's a day longer, a couple of days that are day longer. So there's like a five day. There's well, like the a thing five is, is the months are the months are 28 days long, lunar calendar wise. So it should fall in the. 
I but you have plus there, or minus but... because it's like like you said. I remember reading. Yeah, that. they'd be they basically would take it to like a council, and they would listen to people say when that they when they saw the new moon, and then they would have to retroactively date. Okay, yesterday was the last day of the last, or no, yesterday was the first, but they would never know until the day after that it was the first day of the month for sure. Yeah, so it's like. And the other reason why I think First Fruits is based off of the weekly Sabbath is because he says you have to number seven Sabbaths afterwards. It's like there's not seven holidays afterwards. You're counting seven weekly Sabbaths. Sorry. That was a Right, seven sevens, aside, which, but, which also has a really interesting uh, Oh, that's analogy the other thing about to, the Day of Atonement. To, to, to um, the year of Jubilee. Yes, Day of Atonement. I'll answer the first fruits thing, but yes, so it would fall probably somewhere at the end of the second month or the third month of the the, the biblical calendar. I try not to call it the Jewish calendar because it's not the Jewish calendar; it's the biblical calendar. <laughs> the Israelite because calendar. the Jewish calendar is actually different. Their New Year, the beginning of their their year, starts in Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. I believe the Feast of Trumpets is the, the, the marker for it, or it's either that or Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. I think it's Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of their their civil year, basically. Yeah. Um, so they actually have like three New Years. They have like their civil year, which is Rosh Hashanah, and then they have their, their feast year, which is Adar, um, which is where the feast of, or not a dar, but uh, Nisan, a bib, mm -hmm. a bib. And then they've got, then the, they've got the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> yeah. And well, there's they a keep track of everything. And else I by. think that there's another calendar too. It's the, like the, the calendar of the Kings, like where they actually, I think it, um, it marks the be the beginning of the year of a King. So every time like a year, a king completes a year or whatever, it gets added. And I think that's the 12th month, but I don't know. I haven't gone into that I've one. Never Just heard of take that, that with a grain of, a huge grain of salt, um, spit it out if it's too flavorful. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the Day of Atonement, uh, Leviticus 25.9 says that the Day of Atonement um, uh, is supposed to be used as... Uh, let me let me just go read it because it's only one verse. Leviticus Vit, Leviticus twenty five verse yeah. So uh, verse eight gives you kind of the directions for the fiftieth year. Um, you shall number seven sabbaths of years unto thee seven times seven years, and the space of the seven sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the. Tenth day, day of, of the seventh, seventh month. month. And the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And then ye shall hollow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty. So that one's interesting. So like on the fee on the day of atonement, on the forty ninth year, you're supposed to blow the trumpet saying everybody's about to be released, right? And then you wait, you know, the other well, Five it would months. be particularly eventful. Like it was a big deal for everybody, but it was particularly eventful, I think, for the sojourners, mm -hmm. because the Hebrew slaves they would be freed after six years in the Sabbath year, every Sabbath. And I'm not sure if it was in the Sabbath or if it was six years from when they were enslaved. Yeah, and so. I know land was like that, so you you count well because land, only land, land was released in jubilee. Slaves, Hebrew slaves, were released every seven years. Yeah, but non Hebrew Unless. slaves, <laughs> non Hebrew slaves were only ever released because it says you can bequeath them to your children and have them yeah. as perpetual inheritance, except for jubilee. Yeah, everybody, which goes everybody, through. even yeah. non Jewish slaves would. Be I free. wonder when our next jubilee is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if the year that Jesus died, even though it doesn't necessarily say it in Scripture, I wouldn't be surprised if that year was the year of Jubilee. I, I think that it probably lined up perfectly. Um, I don't know if it ever says in Scripture if they ever so actually It doesn't Jubilee. even mention it in the New Testament. Like, it, like tabernacles and even the Feast of Lights gets mentioned in John as like Jesus going up during the Feast of Lights, which is Hanukkah, but it's not in the Bible. But um, so Passover and Tabernacles and the Feast of Lights get mentioned, but in uh, Unleavened Bread 
and I think first fruits, but Day of Atonement and the Feast of Trumpets never really gets mentioned as being observed. Right. Well, and then the reason, one of the reasons that God kicked them out, it specifically says, I forget where, that to give the land the 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 rest, yeah, because they never were practicing. They were not the practicing years. it, and actually, uh, I think there was supposed to be a specific curse. I can't, I don't know where it is right now, but for every time they didn't give, uh, he he cursed them. I think in the law, saying that every time you don't observe the jubil or the seventh year of rest, you're going to be in captivity for a year. And so basically they wound up filling up their cup of wrath mm -hmm. to 70 years when the king of Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar came and took them away. Because it was 490 years from when they entered the land until the first captivity, I think. Um, There's something precise like that. Uh, yeah, well, it, I think it even matches the timeline from the promise that uh, he gave to Abraham saying that they will be in Egypt. Or no, they're not going to be in Egypt, but... Um, there's going to be a period of time where they're in, they're in Egypt until I bring them out again. And I think that happens. And actually, there's three sets of these things happening, right? Because he tells Abraham, is like, they're going to be in captivity for so, for like 400 and something years. And then the Babylonian captivity was um, another set of seven. And then Daniel's 70th week is another set of 490 years. Yes. So the going forth of the commandment until the Messiah, the prince, was supposed to be 490 years. So I found that passage in uh, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21. Well, I'll start back. I'll start back in verse 19. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall. Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Yep. So there are 490 years that they weren't practicing their Sabbath years, which makes me think, well, if they weren't practicing the Sabbath years, they probably weren't practicing Jubilee either. Because if they're not keeping track of the sevens, what makes you think they keep track of the seven sevens? And this is why he got so mad at them. And when you read the prophets, and, and he even says in the prophets, he's like, I hate your new moons and your Sabbaths and your solemn feasts. It's That's like, because you're not Isaiah. listening to me. That's at the beginning of Isaiah. He's like, I'm sick of your sacrifices. I hate them. They're a stench, right? It's like returned. Like, it's not that he hated the things that he appointed. He hated their attitude towards it, their, their disregard for mm -hmm. his, his law toward it. Well, and that goes all the way back to the beginning of the kingdom with Saul. You know, yeah, it's like, uh, why? Samuel, Samuel says, you should have obeyed me. Don't disobey and said, well, I disobeyed so that I could make a sacrifice. So there's this interesting thing he tells Jeremiah and says, uh, in the fourth year of King Darius, that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, um, when they had sent unto the house of God, Sheazer and Regamelech, Regamelech, and their men to pray before the Lord. And to speak unto the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophet, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself, as I have done these so many years? So I think there's actually a fifth month fast that they had instituted themselves that he's referring to. Um, then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, the day of atonement, even though seventy years did ye at all fast unto me, even to me, and when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Again, hearkening back to I hate your new moons and your Sabbaths and your feasts. Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south and the plain? And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother, 
Oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away their shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it seems like, and I was having a conversation on Facebook with somebody about this the other day. He's a, he's in real estate. And I've been thinking about this. I've done, we recorded another podcast a couple of, was it two years ago, maybe a year ago on, um, like biblical borrowing and lending practices, mm -hmm. which is something that I've never really heard anybody discuss at length. So I'm like, I'm going to assemble every passage I can find in the Bible that talks about borrowing and lending, how it's supposed to be done, how it was done, where the Bible explicitly says they did yeah. it right or they did it wrong. And um, one of the things is talking about, like, you be, you need to have a Sabbath year in terms of your borrowing and lending practices. Like, you're, you're not allowed to have, yeah. if it's a brother, uh, a I would say, uh, it says specifically, an Israelite lending to an Israelite, and I would say it's a Christian lending to a Christian. If you have that, you're not allowed to have him in debt longer than six years. No matter how big the debt is, you're yeah. supposed to forgive it in the seventh year as like a Sabbath year. And I feel like this is one of the things, like, we haven't been doing that. Like, I, I asked um, one of the elders, I was like, so where do people around here go to get mortgages and stuff? And they're like, oh, they just go down to the local thing. I'm like, are there Christians in there lending? So is it their money or... Because because either way, if you've got, let's say, an eight-year mortgage, you're either putting yourself in debt to an unbeliever, which is always undesirable, yeah. or you're putting yourself in debt to a believer and he's sinning in how he's lending to you. Yeah. So those are both bad. <laughs> uh, if you can help it. Um, not that it's a sin to necessarily be in debt. And that's the first, that's where the conversation always turns. They're like, you think it's a sin to borrow money? I'm like, no. It's not a sin to borrow money, it's but a it's curse. a sin to oppress people. It's, well, it's a, it's a, it is an outright sin to put another Christian brother in debt to you for yeah. longer than six years. I would, I could argue that very strongly. But it's not a sin to be in debt. It's a curse. But yeah. having the measles, that's a result of the curse too. Like, would I want to sign up to get the measles, it may be, but as a general rule, no. Yeah. Or like, why would I want to get cancer? Why would I sign on the dotted line for cancer? Yeah. To to relieve somebody else of their cancer? Okay, great. But like, it's a pretty short list of things, and I think people don't quite give enough weight to being in debt, and especially like they've never asked the question: Is the person at the bank that I'm borrowing from whose money is this, and are they a believer or an unbeliever? Because it makes a difference. Yeah. And so it's basically the, the same way that the Jews for just completely ignored their Sabbath years. I think we're doing that it's exact same thing in our borrowing and lending practices. We're doing it in a lot more other, in a lot of other areas too, because I think this is the kind of thing that Paul talks about to the Corinthians when he's like, why are you taking each other before the Gentile courts? You guys why, don't have somebody wise it's enough like to... like, you guys can't discern between good and evil be, uh, amongst yourselves. Right. The pattern is that they're supposed to come and ask our advice because we're so wise. Yeah. Not only are they not bringing our, their stuff to us, we're having to go ask them their advice. Yeah. So it's it would be like Solomon going to the Queen of Sheba. Yeah. <laughs> instead of the other way around. Yeah. And I, yeah. Well, when you think that the law got completely nailed to the cross and forgot about and changed, you just you throw the baby out with the bathwater. The I think. the analogy because people always tend to think of fulfilling meaning is synonymous with abolish. Yeah, annulling. Well, or then disannulling. why did Christ say? Don't think that I came to <laughs> abolish it. I fulfilled it. Yeah. So in oh, that sense, man. they're opposites. So I like to think of it like the, the water in this bottle is fulfilling this water bottle. When I put water in it, does the bottle disappear? No. Of or is it not. more necessary than it used to be? Yeah. If it disappeared, I'd get water everywhere. Yeah. Like, Honestly, the thing that like boggles my mind is we go through Psalms and we read it and we're like praising God. And we read these Psalms about how David's praising God for delighting in his law and delighting in his word. How his lamp, his law is a light into his right. feet and lamp into his path. Longest, and we have a whole 
psalm dedicated to just how awesome the law is and his word and that his would statutes. take you an hour to sing if you actually sang the whole thing through <laughs> yeah we we're like okay but never mind i'm not it's like i delight in the new commandments it's like which commandments was he telling you to follow to show that you love him and it's like he didn't give that many new commandments he just gave them the the he actually There's only two. didn't give anything new. He just said, like, look, this is what they mean. Well, the this one is what he I says meant. specifically is new. He said, love one another as I have loved you. This is the new commandment that I give. So in that sense, it, it was new because the Jews, I mean, you could obey unto the point of this. But Jesus is saying, no, obey even further than yeah. the extent of what you're thinking. That's the, what's new. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and it's, I mean, Jesus's criticism of, of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time was never, you're not, it was never, you're taking my laws too seriously. It was always, you're not taking them seriously enough and you're nullifying them. Yeah. One of the things that blew my mind was uh, reading when he was telling the Pharisees is like, you tithe of the mint and anise, but you leave off the weightier matters of the law. Uh, what does he say? Righteousness and justice and and you devour widows' houses. Yeah, you devour widows' houses. He's like, you should have done the one without neglecting, without neglecting the other. So he says, yeah, you should be tithing your you mint and dill and You should be doing cumin, that. But don't do those to the exclusion yeah. of the bigger ones. They were never supposed to. This is the thing that he says in Proverbs. He says, the Lord abhors an imbalance, Right. He abhors unjust scales. He he doesn't want us being so nitpicky about the law that the letter of the law destroys my brother. Meanwhile, you've got but these you don't gaping need... holes in these other areas you're neglecting. Yeah, it's like, but you also don't be so liberal that you forget to obey me, right? With the the guy in Proverbs at the what, Proverbs twenty seven, he's like, give me enough that I won't complain please lord like don't give me so much that i forget you and don't give me too little that i steal hmm. right he's like I, I want a balance and i feel like we've just neglected so much of the law it's like I, i'm sorry but you honestly you have to read in bias or presumptions or whatever other doctrines you believe you have to read it into the text in the new testament to think that he changed anything mm -hmm. other than that the very specific items he pointed out or that he had the apostles point out of these things did get changed they made specific point to call out circumcision that one's beyond a shadow of a doubt the sign of the covenant that you're under that has been changed. Shadow of doubt. You can't argue against that. Mm -hmm. It's in the text, black and white. Don't do it. Right? Uh, no more animal sacrifices for sin. Your, your atonement sacrifices. Unneeded. Already done. Mm -hmm. Doing it again just puts Christ back up on the cross. Right. Black and, it's and a, it's white. It's a shadow. It's a shot. So, like, why would you want to go back to the types and shadows? Well, it's not about it being a real deal. Well, it's not about it being a shadow. It's the fact that the, the, the thing's not needed anymore and doing it is profaning the Lord, right? Because we still, like, we were talking about, like, Christ says, uh, Passover might not even still be completely fulfilled until he eats it again in his Father's kingdom, right? And it's like we have these holidays that are shadows of things to come. And it's like, yes, but. And, and the thing is, is like Paul makes it specifically clear. It's like we're not to be focused on the shadow. We recognize that it's there, and then it, it, it means that there's an image of something greater. Mm -hmm. We focus on the image, and we know that the end of all of those things is Christ, right? That's what his point is. Is like, look, look into the feast days, look into your Sabbath days, look into your solemn feasts, or whatever it else part of the law that you're doing, and recognize that Christ is the end of it, right? That's the glory, the hope, and the joy that we have in the New Testament and the New Covenant. And it's like, but that doesn't mean leave it off. <laughs> well, and then when Jesus would modify their understanding of the law, like when he would say, uh, you know, divorce 
Moses permitted this because of the hardness of your hearts, but from the beginning it was not so. Yeah. Jesus never relaxed anything. He only tightened the requirements of the law. Yeah. The same thing with the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you know, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'd say to you, whoever looks upon a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. That sounds like the New Testament is, or Harder. Jesus, is, is a whole lot more nitpicky <laughs> yeah. about things that you haven't even done. It's what you're thinking now. Like, and he, Jesus is saying... Um, that was the intent from way back then. Yeah. Um, and so you're arguing that, oh, well, no, I can lust in my heart as long as I don't actually do anything. Jesus says, no, that's not the intent behind these laws. And so Jesus only ever, and then the same thing with divorce. You know, he said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses t- permitted a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce. But he says, he says now, because your hearts shouldn't be hard anymore, they should have been softened over time. Now it's anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. So that's that's a whole lot more. That's a tighter requirement. That's not looser. So yeah. every instance where there's a change, it's the requirement just got upped. Yeah. It never got relaxed or abolished or done away with. Yeah, and I think it. Uh, I think it's in Hebrews, but I can't find it right off the top of my head. But he talks about how before God winked. At their sin, he endured it for a time. But now that it has come and been explicitly explained to us, it's like no more. There's no more wiggle room. There's no more wiggle room. And he, well, he even says it in Hebrews. He says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no, remains no sacrifice. more sacrifice for our sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. And at the end of Romans 2. And it says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That's he that specific, despised Moses' that, law. That's a specific reference to Deuteronomy. And I've even, I had somebody say this online one time. This is one of the juiciest responses that I was ever able to type. And I, I, I remember it to this day. Where somebody said, all you have to do in the New Testament, Jesus gave it in two very simple commands. You know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And I was like, wait a minute, you just quoted Leviticus and Deuteronomy. (laughs) (laughs) You know where that he got that from, right? He wasn't making something up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're quoting Moses. And I'm like, so wait a minute, you're arguing against the Old Testament by Jesus quoting the Old Testament. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Is and he never James, responded, which is always the best. That's what James <laughs> tells him when Paul, when Paul and um, um, Luke might have been with them. When they go up to Jerusalem to talk to the, the other apostles about the whole um, circumcision issue, right? James makes a specific point that says, tell them to not do these things or to do these things or to keep themselves from... I, uh, yeah, the Acts, I think it's Acts 19 council, or it's one yeah, of the Yeah, like Acts 19 Where it or gives them a list of four things. It's like um, abstain from meat, sacrifice to idols, abstain from blood, abstain from uh, something, and abstain, abstain from sexual immorality. Yeah, is it uh, Acts 16? There's been much disputing. Peter rose up. Uh, oh, here, it might be here. Ah, yes, so James, James is talking here, I believe that the residue of all men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. But what does he say next? For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. He's like, look, tell them these things specifically because these are confusing things. It's like, do we still honor these things in the law? He's like, but the rest of the stuff, they have, already they're, they're getting Moses. it from Moses on the Sabbath day. They're getting it from the readings of the law on the Sabbath day. Which is right there right. that the new believers are still worshiping on the Sabbath day. <laughs> and the interesting thing, I looked into that a little bit, and the things being strangled, there's nothing in the law about abstaining from things strangled. The only thing I was able to find that seemed you know, the most conclusive out of all the inconclusive stuff was that there seemed to be a tradition where the Jews would say, because eating blood is, is a cutoff penalty, mm-hmm. um, 
the best way to make sure all of the blood is out of the meat is you turn the animal upside down and you slit its throat while it's still alive yeah. so that the heart pumps out as much blood as possible. Because if you, if you just strangle it and kill it and then try to remove the blood, it's a whole lot more difficult to get all of it out. Yeah. And so, and they still might not have gotten all of it out. So just as a precaution to not eating blood, they wouldn't strangle animals to kill them that were meant yeah. to be eaten. They would, they would slit their throat and then let the animal's heart pump it out as it died. Sure. Yeah. So that's the only thing that I was able to find with it to happen to be a tradition as a precaution like, towards, you know, the eating blood thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it seems to be... Uh, it's something that we should not be doing, apparently. But also, <laughs> I, think, I think it really harkens back to it was... Because the New Covenant is new. It's a it's a problem. There are, now you've got a whole bunch of people proselytizing into into the faith, whereas you know you maybe had a small a slow steady trickle of people, yeah. and they were able to teach them things well enough because like you know somebody comes from another nation and all of a sudden they blaspheme. Well, okay, well now you gotta you have to put that guy to death. So with a small enough trickle of people, they were able to teach them without people just getting themselves killed by ignorance. You know the first yeah. week that they're in the in the land. So in the New Covenant, now you've got a whole ton of people coming in. Well, well, well now what do you do? And there's going to be a, a sharp division between Jews and non-Jews. So they want to promote harmony between them. And so they said, here are the four things that are like most essential right now immediately to promoting harmony between Jews and Gentiles. Sexual immorality, idols, meat sacrifice to idols. And that's a big one even still when Paul's writing. Um and so it's not a it's not a definitive list. I've had people argue that it says that the only thing we need to worry about now in the new covenant is those list of four things. And I'm like, okay, the funny thing is because Paul says idols are nothing. And so if you're a mature believer, you can eat meat sacrificed to idols. Just don't ask for conscience sake, <laughs> or not my conscience, but his conscience. Well, the funny thing is, is that the reason why they came up to this this council was to ask about circumcision, yet when they write the letter, nothing comes out about circumcision. circumcision at all. Yet we still have evidence of the fact that we're not supposed to be circumcised according to Paul's letters, right? Which is really interesting. Uh, but I mean, even still, circumcision goes back to Moses. Moses said, circumcise your hearts. I don't, I, yeah. I never really want, he didn't say this explicitly, but the idea behind it is, you can circumcise your flesh, and that's not worth anything all by itself. Yeah. What's really worth it is circumcising your heart. Which is what Paul talks about explicitly in Romans. Romans 2, he's like, look, uh, just because you're circumcised in the flesh doesn't make you a Jew. I was a about Jew to... inwardly, or those who are circumcised inwardly with the circumcision of the heart, that's what makes you a Jew. I was just right? about to read that from earlier. And he's like, the other me. thing, too, is... Uh, Romans 4, where he talks about Abraham was given the covenant before he was circumcised so that he would be the father of all of them, right? Yeah, circumcision of the heart was first in the covenant and then circumcision of the flesh later. Um, I was going to read the end of Romans 2, where it also, I think, is it Romans 2 or is it Romans 12 that talks about the Jew, whoever has the law has a greater responsibility, too. Because you've been entrusted with it. Too. Yeah. Um, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law in the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing? Do you steal? You say that one who must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Mm. That right there, as an aside thought, is very sobering because it, God actually accounts blas uh, unbelievers blaspheming on our account. He reckons that to us. Mm -hmm. We're responsible for what unbelievers think about God. It's the third commandment. It is do not take the Lord's name in vain. And actually, since you, if you go look up the Hebrew in it, the taking the name in vain, taking it's calling yourself is, by it. Well, it's not just that it's carrying. I, I heard this on a, another video, but the Hebrew word is, um, it's the same as like carrying a standard, 
right? And so the idea is don't carry my standard in vain. Don't go off running and saying, I'm a Christian. And then being not Christian, mm-hmm. don't, don't go saying you're Christ-like and then throwing mud on the thing, right? right? Don't take his name in vain. Right, because you're a representative. You're saying, it's, I mean, it'd be this, the, the example I like to use is somebody who works at a restaurant. You know, you can tell that that person works at a restaurant because they're dressed, you know, at, uh, at Wendy's, they have a hat that says Wendy's on it. They have an apron. They have their name tag. They have all these things. And they're the representative of the company to the customer. Yeah. And me as the customer, I can't just hop the counter and start go, go and work back there because I'm not trusted. I'm not one of the representatives. Yeah. And so it's like the priest in the temple. You can't go here. You're not a priest. This is off limits to you. You don't have the trust. You can do a lot of damage yeah. um, by doing things, being called by God's name, taking his name, carrying it with you, and then act in faithlessness. Yeah. You can do a lot of damage or that way. even improper worship, like offering strange fire, mm-hmm. which is so funny because all of the references he makes to the priesthood... Like, he wanted them to be a holy and peculiar people. Actually, it's one of the... He tells them... um, He says, The Lord that God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments, thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. I wonder where he got that from. (laughs) Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, which is very similar to what Peter says. I wonder where you got that from. And he has promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments and to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor that thou mayest be in holy people unto the Lord thy God as he hath spoken. And this is what Peter's talking about when he says we're a holy and peculiar priesthood. We're a holy and peculiar people. It's like this is always God's plan. And then he even tells them when he's giving them the laws about like Passover and the, the feast, right? He's like, you will have one law for, native for the, the native and the sojourner and the stranger, right? There's one law for you all in this land, right? The place where I'm putting my name. And where has he put his name today, <laughs> right? So in, in Romans 2, oh, yeah, on, yeah. verse 25, for circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. Yep. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Yep. So, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, mm. by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. There was another passage I was... Uh, well, I guess that is it, but I think I felt like there was another passage that talks about being more accountable. Uh, huh. I think It's well, like all 15 epistles. Well, Roman, are, I think it's Roman. However many epistles there are. Yeah, Romans 11. Oh, yeah, Romans. Yeah, grafted. And so that's the thing, too, right? Is He's talking about being grafted into a tree. The tree didn't move and the tree didn't change. But you, being a wild olive branch, were grafted into the tree, right? Which is like, it's like the, the thing didn't change. The plan has always been the same. It's just you got to be included in it. And don't think for a second that just because you're in it and they're not anymore, for now, that you're any better than them. Yeah, I should have just kept on reading. It's uh, Romans 3. It's the same thought. That's a bad chapter division. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, the what advantage then hath the Jew? Right, right. He has an advantage if he reads and understands the law. Ah, yes. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Ah, I yeah, mean, so there's more there's more accountability there you know it's to whom much is given much is required it's the same thing with the parable of the talents and spider-man with great power comes great responsibility <laughs> yeah and what does he say here he says 
For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So, he's like, when you and God are going to get into a fight, and it's like, well, I did what you said to, to you told me to do, or I didn't do that stuff. And what Jesus says is like, oh, when didn't we do these things for you, right? Or when, when did we not feed you or do kind things? He's like, well, when you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it. Like, I don't know you, mm -hmm. right? It's like, but the point is, is like, look, I'm gonna have the scriptural reference. <laughs> like, if God has His own little Bible sitting there on the end table. As we're being judged, it's like, look, I gave you the law and the prophets. It's like, what are you arguing against? <laughs> yeah, and that's even the parable with uh, Lazarus. Well, our, our, it's arguably a parable. That's the only parable where there's. I don't believe it. I don't made. believe Jesus would have made something like that up. <laughs> so, but um, but yeah, he tells the same thing there to the rich man. He said they had Moses and yeah. the prophets. Yeah, even if then one were to return need, from the dead, they won't believe. They won't believe. <laughs> Ah, uh, man. Yeah. Even with uh, even with the um, Sermon on the Mount, I like this was an epiphany that I had. Um, I've had several people argue to me that the reason that the law is abolished was because forgive Jesus. The way that Jesus died and forgave our sins was not according to the law. And I want to say. Do you read Hebrews? I think we have very I think we have a very different definition of what forgiveness means. We tend to think of forgiveness as being like a one step process, but it's actually more than that. Yeah. Like if somebody steals twenty bucks from me, the way we might say I forgive him means I just act like nothing happened. Sure. That's not the biblical concept of what forgiveness is. Yeah, every time I see that guy, I have to remember he stole 20 bucks from me, but I'm not going to hold it against him. <laughs> and I've brought that up to other Christians. They're like, yeah, you know what? I, you know, the way that I quote unquote forgive that person is I just don't require anything back from them. But the funny thing is in talking about it, they remember the dollar amount from something like nine years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was $227.15. Uh -huh. <laughs> Of course it was. <laughs> and Or whatever the amount was. I'm so glad he didn't uh, remove our sins as far as east is from the west. <laughs> right, and then he doesn't remember them anymore. Um, no, forgiveness means that it's no longer remembered. Yeah. The account, like, what do you need the receipt for? This, like, you know, assuming you're not paying taxes on it, but, like, you paid taxes, it's all totally done with, that account is closed, you can get rid of it. And funnily enough, I think that's what most people think of the law. No, forgiveness is, Jesus didn't say, if anyone should slap you on the cheek, act like it never happened. He says, if anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. That's forgiveness. Why is that forgiveness? What's the significance of turning the other cheek? There was a pastor giving a, a sermon on this one time. And for some reason, I don't know where this thought came from. I thought, so is turning the other cheek, is that like a backhanded, could that be? backhanded forgiveness so let's take the whole process like look at the whole judicial process let's so let's say let's say i was to take somebody to court for slapping me on the cheek so if he slaps me and i turn the other cheek and then let's say he slaps me again now if i take him to court he gets to get slapped twice instead of just once because if he <laughs> stopped at the first time he would have only had to been required you know one you know it's cheek blow for blow cheek for cheek sure so he would only have to gotten slapped once. But if I want his penalty to be worse, then I have to offer the other cheek. And if he tapes me up on it, now when I call the cops or whatever, I take him to court, now he gets a worse penalty. And I don't know where that thought came from in my mind, but I, it comes from I, Romans. I considered that briefly. And then I was like, no, that's ridiculous. It's if you slap me on the cheek, what's the penalty for that? You get slapped on the cheek. So when I've been slapped on the cheek, at that point, there is a, there is a slap deuce somebody somewhere, and it's just hanging there. And if what we do, of, if we think of that as, well, I need to forgive him, but without me offering the other cheek, then forgiveness means 
what we think of as quote unquote forgiveness means there's a slap on the cheek just hanging there that hasn't fallen to anybody yet. Mm. So what I'm doing by turning the other cheek is taking it for him is offering to take it for him. So even if he slaps me again, now it's covered. Now that extra slap is not hanging up in the air somewhere. That's forgiveness. It's not, you did something against me. Well, I'll just act like it never happened. Wink, wink. Yeah. It's, no, you do something against me, and it's not settled until I offer to cover your mistake. No and greater love hath any man than this, than he lay down his own life for his brother. So, take and then take the example of... Uh, take the slap for him. Take the example of, well, so that's bodily harm. That one's sure. a little bit more hard to imagine because uh, like a slap hanging in the air is kind of is an abstract thing. But then take the, in the next example he gives is somebody takes your cloak, give him your tunic, or mm -hmm. tunic, give him your cloak. So let's play that whole story out. You take my jacket, and then I t and then I give you my shirt. So now, let's say you eventually get caught by the authorities for stealing from me. Well, what's the penalty for you stealing a garment from me? And you're caught. You're caught with the garment. You pay two garments. Yeah. So you give me my shirt back and my jacket. <laughs> I gave you the means to repay me when the evil happened. I didn't have to take you to court and give you... And so the end result is I get all my stuff back that was originally mine. Mm. And you don't owe me anything that you didn't start with. And now we're all even. And we can be... We're friends again. Justice has been done. And I was merciful. Mercy covers the iniquity. And that came from me. Yeah. It's not just you stole something from me and I give you another one. It's like, well, now I'm out two things. What use is that? Well, no, in God's justice that he will require that justice from that person's hand, yeah. the repayment from it. And so everything comes out all together in the end and everything will be perfectly restored back to the initial situation. And you won't be in debt to me anymore. I mean, isn't that what the, uh, what is it? John says the high priest prophesied about it's more expedient for one man to die for the nation than for mm -hmm. the entire nation to to perish. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. I think that's I think that falls I, I think that would fall in line with what Paul was talking about is like uh, pray for those who like spitefully use you and feed them for when they're hungry. Your reward will be great. For your reward will be great and you reap coals of fire on their head. <laughs> There's not much detail about what's supposed to be done at Pentecost is that is that true let's see trumpets there's not much detail trumpets there's, booths, like no. there's not much detail booths there yeah booths there's a little bit but basically the idea is it's like remember that you're sojourners right you're well not. and it's Paul it's it's specifically names a few deck three decorations the yeah. fruit of splendid trees palm palm leaves and just like leafy, yeah, leafy branches. That's why I like going to some of the references or uh, trying to find where they, where the observances were in the Bible, because that also kind of indicates. Oh, there was like an interesting were, thing. What they were doing. Um, I don't think I mentioned this when we brought it up, but like they might have to add an extra month. You said it was roughly every thirteen years, and I remember reading that they call that a pregnant year. Yeah, I don't know much about that. I just I and, I know because of the way that the lunar cycle works. Well, so the only to, ever reference to that is in Jeremiah, where he's told to lay on his side for a certain number of days, and if you calculate from when it says he started to the time he ended, and he did that for the certain number of days, you should actually be a month further in the calendar year, but because they added an extra month it's all the numbers still work out so that's the only oh he did it on a leap year or something he did it on a, it was a leap there was a, an extra month in there that was a 13th month huh but the bible never commands to add an extra month but there there's evidence there that, that at least that's how they were doing it at the time yeah um oh and then also one other difficult thing and obviously this was before the law was given but for the number of days that the flood waters were on the earth 
it references months being 30 days with Noah. The only way that the numbers work out for how many months and how many days it said is if you had exactly 30 day months. Uh, yeah, I was actually wondering about, um, cause you kept mentioning that uh, the months were 30 days. I'm like, where are you getting that from? But that's interesting that it goes back to Noah because- Cause that's before Moses. That's it's before, before Moses, but it's also during the flood and How do you a lot keep of time during well, the when thing it's about it is, is is a lot of cosmological things happened during the flood other than just the flood because of the the power of the deeps breaking open and what was going on and probably volcanic eruptions as well or something like that um this is some speculation um it's it's possible that the 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 earth was actually in a more perfect uh cycle like rotation where you wouldn't have to add a 13th where month. you wouldn't have to do that and you actually had a balanced lunar and even solar cycle um but when the disruptions of the earth happened um it actually shifted us and actually put us on our tilt to begin with and we had um <clears throat> so in genesis 7 it yeah. specifically says 600th year of Noah's life in the seventh, the second month on the 17th day on the month. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And then we're, we're also told exactly how many days he was on the ark. Yeah, the interesting thing is, is, like, is it talking about the calendar year month or is it talking about his age? Like, is it the 600th? Hundredth and second month year and, of Noah's life. Oh, oh, like how many months? Like if his yeah, is it his six hundredth year and it's the second month of his six hundredth year and it's the seventh day, seventeenth day of the second month of the six hundredth year of Noah's life. Oh, interesting. Or is it the year of his six hundredth birthday? Right, the it's first the month second month of the seventeenth day yeah. of his six hundredth year, which means Noah's birthday was in the fir- between the first month and the second month and the seventeenth day. <laughs> I don't know, or or it's just specifically referring to his age and not necessarily referencing the yeah. calendar of the day. Um, um, so it says, God told Noah to board the ark a week before the flood start, which meant he would have been on board for three hundred and seventy seven or three hundred and seventy eight days. Um, this is an article. I'm not sure how accurate this is. I'm looking for just reference points. So you could just say in the 600th year, in the second month, on the 10th day, he went into the ark, right? Okay, so here are the references. Okay, uh, so Genesis 7, 1, God tells Noah to go into the ark. Mm-hmm. Genesis 7, 4, he says, in seven days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. And then it says, the day that the water's broke forth was 17th day of the month. So if Noah had been in the ark a week already, that means he got in in the second day on the he got in day on of the, the month on the 10th. On the 10th day of the second month. Right. Yeah. So then he was there a week. So now we're on the 17th. Mm-hmm. And then you got 40 days and 40 nights to that. And then it says the earth, the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days after that. Um, so you're up to 47, and, well, and then, then it says, after that, it was another 150 days? Well, and then, but in chapter, uh, in chapter 7, verse 12, it appears the number 150 includes the, the 40 days and 40 nights. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days, and you said what verse? Uh, verse 12. And, and the up. rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights? Uh... The number 150 in verse 24. Oh, 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So that apparently includes so the 40. So it includes the 40? Or is it not just so that then the, it was, there was 40 days of Philip and then it there lasted a, for 150 100 and, days? 110 days after the initial 40 flood, it seems. Maybe. And then it says, And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month in the 10th month on the first day of the month. The tops of the mountains were seen. Where is this? Genesis 8, 5. Hold on. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day. 
and the waters decrease continually until the tenth month, and the tenth month on the first day of the month. And then another 40 days, and then another like two weeks after that. So from the ark, from him, from the rains starting until the seventh month were, it says, and the waters returned from off the earth continually, and at the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. So I think okay, that there's so a the reference to is, how many months those 150 days are. Yeah, so it says in the 600th year of Noah's life, the 17th day of the second month, the rains started. Mm -hmm. And then verse 3 is the connection. Um, or sorry, verse 24 then says there, were rain, there was water on the earth for 150 days. Maybe or maybe not including that 40 days of rain. But then the waters returned off of the earth until the end of the 150 days. And then at the end of the 150 days, the ark rested on the 17th day of the seventh month. So um, five months later. Right. So 150 days, if there are 30 day months, that's five months. But what if it doesn't include the 40 days? What if it's 100 and 90 days between five months so that now you have more days 30, now you have 38 yeah, day you have months. more days so it's probably more likely that it's 190 divided by five yeah that would be more what that, yeah that's 38 i guess right 38 days a month which makes no sense but if you have 30 day months the 17th day of the second to the 17th day of the seventh mm -hmm. that's exactly five months and 150 days only if you have exactly 30 day months yeah, but then a lot happened, Cosmo, like I said, I believe a lot happened after that that started. Like, r relatively short time for Noah, things were probably the same. But Noah lived a long time after that, right? Mm -hmm. And then there was like a bunch of things that happened. And so that shift over that amount of time of all of the stuff that happened during the flood, all the breaking of the deeps and shooting debris out to the moon, mm -hmm. which is why we probably have moon craters. Um, but anyways, all of that stuff that happened to the earth during the flood wound up like shifting us so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been earthquakes that have changed the length of the 24 hour day or the or not the not the 24 hour day, but the yeah, that's just on a small scale. The 365.257 whatever days per year. Yeah. It's like so trying to sense, draw like a the, straight line. The result of the Jewish calendar or the, the biblical calendar, maybe with the new moons, not lining up exactly with 30 day months. The reason it's so complicated is because the earth has fallen and now the rotation of the earth has actually slowed down mm -hmm. compared to the how often the moon. Those used to be apparently in sync. Yeah. Apparently. So apparently it used to be 360 day years, possibly exactly. Um, I'll buy that. And the result of... God having to deal with sin means that the lunar cycle and the solar cycle don't line up anymore. So there's, a, that. there's a chasm in between that. But we now have to the decision for. is: is who do I go with? <laughs> right. <laughs> do I go off of the thing that God said to base my time off of, or do I go off of I have to be in the world but not of it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can do both. <laughs> That's the challenge for so many things. I like to the the name I like to call it is um, idealistic incrementalism so you can be an idealist but also realize that it takes steps to get yeah. there you can't be an absolutist in terms of i either have to have the absolute ideal or i'm not interested in changing anything i'm being made perfect i'm just not there yet <laughs> right. so i'm not even going to try if i can't be perfect tomorrow i'm not going to do anything about it yeah and that's folly that's hiding your talent under the rocks mm -hmm. um oh interesting thing feast wise for this year i believe that this Passover schedule that's coming up and where Easter falls on inside the Passover schedule this year, this year's calendar matches what I believe would have been the calendar cycle of when it actually happened. <laughs> so Passover is actually falling on the day of the week where the next day Christ would have been crucified and then three days later he would have risen. And then, so that means Easter, coincidentally, is actually the day falling Jesus on the resurrection the day. <laughs> because I believe that it's Passover and then three, the third day of Passover, which might also be an indication of when first fruits is. Like, 
Is first fruits always the third day of Passover? Because, because of the resurrection? Because it is first fruits supposed to happen on a Sabbath? It's supposed to happen on the morrow after the Sabbath is what it says. Okay. But which could be any day Sabbath. during. Yeah. But the thing is, it could just be the Sabbath of unleavened bread. But it's a thing. So in God's sovereignty in the calendar, he planned it in a way where the Passover schedule was Passover or, yeah, he died on Passover. He died on the first day of unleavened bread was put in the earth during preparation day, was in the earth for three nights during a weekly Sabbath, and then the first day of the week happened to also be the Feast of first fruits. And so he rose on the first day of the week, which is also the Feast of first fruits in that Passover week, which is because Easter celebrates the resurrection and not first fruits, this year Easter actually falls. It, it will actually, actually will be, be the Feast of First Fruits. Fruits. Interesting. Unbeknownst to all the Easter <laughs> celebrators. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's really kind of fun. Yeah, I don't know. I maybe First Fruits is supposed to be a constant day. I don't know. He doesn't say. He says the morrow after the Sabbath, and maybe the one year he did it in his sovereignty, he did it in a way where it was Passover Sabbath first fruits and we really didn't even get into talking about sabbaths but i mean it's i mean technically it's within yeah i think leviticus 23 does talk about sabbaths first we're going to talk about sabbaths let's go to isaiah 56 and then 58 or the end of 57 anyways i gotta head out